include glows for blood collection or for uh, uh, processes which are of medium risk like vaginal examination. There, the, uh, the PPE should include glows, mask, apron, goggles. Then for high risk processes like incision and drainage or any operative procedures, it should include all the PPE. The correct sequence for donning and doffing should be followed. For donning, uh, gown, mask, apron, goggles, and gloves. Before wearing a gloves and after uh, after removal of the gloves, strict hand rubbing should be done, and the correct sequence should be followed from gown, apron, goggle to the gloves. While for doffing, reverse procedure should be stringently followed. That is first removal of gloves, then goggles, gown, mask, other respirator, and others. While doing the doffing, after doffing of each of the uh, PPE, strict hand rub should be done. While we, while we do an audit, the, the ICN or the ICO does an audit, this audit form should be better be used for, aud for auditing, the, uh, auditing the healthcare personnel for that doning and doffing, which include the hand hygiene followed or not, uh, PPE applied in the correct sequence or not, appropriate type of gown is being worn or not, while, talking, uh, while taking out the PPE, PPE is removed in an isolation empty room, PPE is removed in the correct sequence or not, since this audit should be done for donning and doffing, and should, it should be recorded for any bit purpose. Then, at what should be the evidence for the any bit? Uh, 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 there should be adequate stock and supply of soap, disinfectants, and PPE. Staff training records should be available on donning and doffing of PPE. An audit of PPE should be done. Now, coming to the main thing, uh, this was about a general uh, general thing that I spoke about uh, hospital inpatient control as per any bit. Now, I would like to go in detail uh, about each of these measures, starting with hand hygiene. The hospital, now HIC 2 standard of NAB says that the hospital takes actions to reduce the risk of hospital associated infections or healthcare associated infections in patients and employees. Hand hygiene facilities should be available accessible to all healthcare providers. So why is hand hygiene as important? Thousands of people die every day around the world because of healthcare associated infections. And hands are the main culprits. The five, the 10 fingers of the hand are the main path, pathways for, for transmitting the pathogens. Hand hygiene should be strictly done. It's logical, but still it is not compliant. So that's an issue. So most of the action do, 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 do the root cause analysis, most of the uh, we don't want, we don't get time. That is the most often reason uh, for the non-compliance to hand hygiene. So it should be ensured that the uh, 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 hand hygiene should be strictly followed because if a patient gets an infection, that further adds to the time and to the expenses of both of the patient as well as the hospital. So you must do stringent hand hygiene to protect the patients and also yourself also, and also the other patients and visitors and the healthcare person of the hospitals. How to perform hand hygiene? Hand hygiene should be, uh, for a hand hygiene, the hands should be, the hands should be completely free of all accessories. The hands uh, should be free of any rings, the bangles, trays, watches, or trays, while in a patient zone. In a patient zone, there should be a strict protocol, protocol in the healthcare setting that there, there should be no accessories on the healthcare personal hand, hand because these accessories like rings, bangles, chairs, watches, and other things interfere with the hand hygiene. So as per when we, in a GSA in the hospital, as per GSA standard, for the audit, they see that they observe the hands and, and if there is there any accessories on the hand, they put a non-compliance. Similarly, the, for the NABH, the hand should be free of all access, uh, accessories while in a patient zone or, or of a healthcare personal. Uh, if you don't do properly, the hand is not well, uh, that is, that is a prerequisite. Yeah, to hand hygiene properly, the, uh, the web spaces in between the fingers, the dorsum of the hand is often missed. We do hand hygiene just uh, with uh, we, we uh, the, just take some amount of hand rub in our hands and just uh, do hand rub. But a, prop, a, a proper amount of hand rub should be should be taken should be taken and uh, say uh, say about three pushes of hand rub should be taken with uh, with, with one one push one and a half to two ml comes. So about three pushes about we get about five to six ml. So five to six ml of a hand rub should be taken or adequate amount of soap and water should be taken. La, la, then. Uh, still, the, it fills the cup of cup of the hands. Then the seven steps of the hand hygiene should be followed. Now, what are the seven steps? <clears throat> I'd like to demonstrate here. First, first step is palms to palms, then palms with the dorsum, and vice versa. Then palms to palms with the finger interlaced, then the back of the fingers into the opposite palms, then the rotational rubbing of the fingers into the opposite palms. Then, then, the, then the rotation of the thumbs into the opposite, opposite palm, and finally the wrist. 
this seven step even if the sequence get disturbed the seven steps should be followed to ensure that each of the space of the hands are covered by hand rub or the hand wash and it should and it should be done for at, if you are doing a hand rub it should be done for 20 to 30 seconds at least and if you are doing a hand wash it should be done for at least 40 to 60 seconds as said before, hand wash, I repeat again, hand wash should be done when the hands are visibly solid with dirt and dust, and especially for the patients, patients with uh, multidrug organisms like uh, infected multidrug organisms like prostidium or diarrhea or dysentery and others. And hand hygiene should be done at the five moments of, pay, of hand hygiene. Now, which are those five moments of hand hygiene? Before touching a patient, be, after touching a patient, before any procedure which involves blood or body fluids exposure, after any procedure which involves blood or body uh, exposure fluids, and after touching a patient surroundings. We, I have often seen that before and after touching a patient or, or in procedure, hand hygiene is done. But after touching a patient surroundings, it is often missed. And that is the, that is the most contaminated area. I said before, after touching a patient surroundings like piles and tables and floors, hand rub should be done or hand wash should be done if visibly soiled to, because we can get infected by multidrug pathogens like MRS or VRE and others. So that was about the seven steps and the five moments of hand hygiene. Now, what, what should be the facilities available for hand hygiene? Running soap and water should, uh, should be desired in a healthcare setting. Hand disinfect, hand antiseptic, the correct term should be a hand antiseptic. Uh, hand antiseptic should be available at the patient bedside. Hand antiseptic at the point of entry point of the critical area or the isolation area should be available. Now, what does it take? It, uh, it can be either hand wash, the soap and water, or a hand rub with a 70% alcohol. I repeat again, hand rub, the alcohol hand rub should be EN, EN approved. <clears throat> These are the seven steps that, that we discussed. If we do a surgical hand, hand wash, surgical hand wash is, uh, for surgical procedures, it should be done at least for two to five minutes. And the, the difference between the surgical hand wash and the uh, regular hand rub or hand wash is that the surgical hand, hand wash is done till the elbows. And special and care should be taken before, after a hand rub or a hand wash or a surgical hand wash, hands should be completely dry. See, there is a con there, we do a hand rub with an alcohol. The alcohol requires a contact time, at least for some for 20 to 30 seconds, uh, at least for a minute. So, so that the contact period should be given for the alcohol to get active and so the hands uh, get decontaminated or uh, disinfected. So after our hands are completely dry, then only the procedure should be done or the patient should be approached for care. The ICN or the ICO, the infection control nurse or the officer, should regularly do monitoring of the hand hygiene practices by, as you can see from this picture, by using a UV light or using any other such methods by either observing or by through camera or using such UV light, you can monitor the hand hygiene practices and regular audit should be done. Audit, you can use the WHO hand hygiene checklist, which is a very simple to follow. In this checklist, we see that a hand rub or a hand wash is the is followed, is complied during the five moments of hand hygiene. Then the competency checklist, then the competency checklist should be done for monitoring hand hygiene of the healthcare personnel. Mm. To see that all, all stages must be carried out of, uh, as competent. That is palm to palms and palm to fingers, interlace and others. The evidence for a hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the most important measure. Any basis that there are facilities for a hand hygiene available or not. So adequate hand hygiene facilities should be available. That is the sink, uh, um, elbow operated uh, tab, uh, uh, or hand hygiene training records are available, or availability of hand hygiene posters, or uh, hand hygiene audit tools are available and audited. So these are the evidence that, that is checked by the NAB assessors for, as an evidence of strict hand hygiene in the healthcare setting. Then HSC 2C standards says that appropriate pre and post exposure prophylaxis is provided. We'll see in detail in the next slides. When a pre and post exposure prophylaxis means vaccination, but there are challenges in vaccination. Do you know what are the vaccines available in the healthcare facility and who pays for the vaccine? Is this the management of the employee? Do you know the condition that requires post exposure prophylaxis? That should be that should be that should be informed to all the healthcare personnel. Now, which are the common vaccines given in healthcare facility? It includes hepatitis B virus uh, vaccine. That, that is hepatitis B as antigen titers. So when we give a hepatitis B vaccine, in, in, I have seen that in most of the settings, just the vaccine is given. But please note that 
around five to ten percent of the population in Indian setting are uh, non-responders. That is, even after vaccine vaccination, they don't produce the adequate antibody titer. Just do a titer of all the healthcare personnel. Out of about five percent of them will have, even after vaccination, they will have a low antibody titer. Now, what is the antibody titer required? It should be at least ten antibody and uh, ten units of hepatitis B antibody titer for a protection against hepatitis B infection. So after vaccination of the healthcare personnel with the hepatitis B vaccine, which is in a three doses, zero month, one month, six month. So after one month after the third dose, that is after the sixth month, one month after the third dose, a titer should be checked. It should not be immediately checked, but one to two months after the third dose, titer should be checked and ensure that the healthcare personnel have adequate titer of at least 10 units. And the, and the, uh, the personnel it is advised as per the hospital, the hospital can make its own protocol that the, uh, the, 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 the uh, staff which has a title less than 10, they better avoid exposure prone activities like operation, uh, like uh, handling uh, sharp instruments or blood or body to expo uh, exposure risks. So that was about hepatitis B vaccine and the titers. The another vaccine is the tetanus toxide. It should be, it should be given, the tetanus toxide should be given at regular intervals, just say, then for the food and then for the food handlers, typhoid typhoid vaccine should be typhoid vaccine should be given. Then uh, it's uh, uh, as it's, it's in a hospital it should be a hospital protocol that they, some of the some population of the healthcare personnel should have a vaccine for various like joster against chicken pox and, and also against flu vaccine also for pay, handling patients with chicken pox and for swine flu uh, H1N1 in uh, infection uh, respectively. Then records of post exposure prophylaxis. If a patient gets in, if a uh, staff gets a uh, exposure to uh, blood and body fluid via injury, sharp injury, or via blood spirit and others, so the post exposure prophylaxis to other should be given, or HIV prophylaxis should be given, and the record should be available for any bit audit. That was about the hand hygiene, the PPE, and the staff, and the staff, and the uh, safe in syntax, and these uh, sharp pro pro protocols. Coming to the next thing, the housekeeping. HIC 1B standard of NMBA says that cleanliness and general hygiene of the facilities should be maintained and monitored. As said before, environmental hygiene is equally important as hand hygiene, and environmental hygiene should be strictly followed and should be monitored and monitored. You can see from this image, one pet is bad housekeeping and one another is good housekeeping. The measures should be taken that there's a good housekeeping in the healthcare setting. So what does it say? Wrong method should be avoided. As you can see from this image, it's, it's a bi-directional method of cleaning is used. It should be avoided. It should be unidirectional method that is from a clean to dirty. The method of cleaning should be from clean to dirty or from innermost to outermost areas. When you do a, uh, when you do a cleaning in the ward areas or an ICU areas, the direction of the cleaning should be from the innermost to the outermost area. So start first from, from as you see, from the entrance and start from, from the inner, inner areas to the outermost areas. Similarly, similarly for cleaning of OT, the cleaning of the OT should be done from the clinic, from the from the cleanest areas to outwards. The principle is the cleaning should be from, from clean to dirty and from the in, uh, clean to dirty areas. And the correct method should be should be followed. It should not be like a zigzag, but it should be from a unidirectional way. As I said before, the figure of eight, uh, uh, figure of a uh, eight uh, type of cleaning could, could be for, followed for mopping. When you when the housekeeping does a mopping. See that uh, they say that the correct the, the correct mop or the duster is used for for the environmental cleaning. Uh, dedicated mops and dusters should be available. Color coded the, the uh, mops and dusters should be there available in healthcare setting for clay for mopping and uh, mopping dry, whether dry mopping or wet mopping. Uh, appropriate color coded uh, mops and dusters should be available. Then safety measure when 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 there is a wet floor cleaning. The uh, poster should be the the signage board should be there that there's a caution that the wet floor because fall fall can arise because because uh, for wet floor so the wet floor signal should be there to notify people while walking the area that is so uh, that the area might be slippery. All housekeeping staff should wear a appropriate PPE while performing housekeeping activities. It is seen that more than half of these injuries or exposure to blood and body fluids are among the housekeeping staff. Uh, so uh, they should be provided with appropriate PPE and training for cleaning activities. 
then hospitals should adhere to the rodents and the pest control standards in both clinical and non clinical areas of the hospital hospitals should ensure that the appropriate pest control is done in operations and high risk areas at least and that a designated person should be informed about the sightings of rodents or other pests now what are the evidence of uh, required for any pest documentation of housekeeping practices in the hsc manual then daily cleaning records should be available the training records of housekeeping staff should be available then the audit reports on the housekeeping practices should be available then the safety data sheet msds of the cleaning materials the disinfectants should be available and then uh, housekeeping staff awareness interview should be uh, is done during an mbh audit the hsc 1c standards uh, of uh, mbh say that cleaning and disinfection practices are defined and monitored as appropriate frequency of cleaning the routine cleaning is done or based on the following criteria high touch surface or low touch surface now cleaning high touch surface high touch surface in a hospital are surfaces that are in frequent contact with hands such as doors bed rails and elevator buttons so focus should be done or given to for cleaning such high touch surfaces <laughs> then cleaning low, low touch surfaces low touch surfaces are surfaces that are in minimal contact so this surface should be cleaned regularly and when a patient gets discharged such uh, this area has some good floors and walls patient care equipment should be cleaned and then based on the degree of risk involved each equipment should be either disinfected or sterilized we'll go in details in the, uh, in the next slides about disinfection and cleaning of equipment spill management kit should contain Uh, newspapers for uh, cleaning, 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 uh, or some paper material for cleaning the way uh, the spills, or a LO hazard bag, and all the PPE which includes cap, goggles, and others. Chlorine tablet for disinfection. Then measuring cup or tongs and brushes as appropriate for the spill management. Now, for handling blood and body fluid spillage, before handling a blood or body fluid, housekeeping staff should wear a proper PPE, appropriate PPE. And if the surface is non-porous, then it should be decontaminated with one percent hypochlorite solution. Now, what are the steps involved in cleaning blood and body fluids? The decontaminated area should be confined. Contaminated area should be confined. Yes, a board, a spillage board should be put up. Then the area should be flooded with a chemical liquid or chemical disinfectant before cleaning. Then the area should be decontaminated with a fresh germicidal chemical of a of a intermediate level disinfection. so there are levels of disinfectant disinfectant low intermediate and high so at least a intermediate disinfectant should be used we'll see the we'll see the different disinfectants in the next slides <clears throat> usually it is a 1% hypochlorite solution that is used for disinfection of a blood spillage area disinfection is a process where most microbes except endospores spores are removed from a object or a surface so based on the utility uh, uh, the uh, the disinfectant is that deter determined Now, how to select a disinfectant? Mostly, it is done on the basis of Spalding classification. Now, what is the Spalding classification? Spalding classification states that there are a uh, uh, when uh, when while for instruments which enter into the human body, uh, as such uh, 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 as uh, human body uh, in contact with the organs, such items are labeled as critical items. And for items which are in contact with the mucous membrane, such items are semi-critical items. And some items which are in touch with skin only, not with the mucous membrane, those items are uh, non-critical items. So this is the Spalding classification of instruments. So for instruments with uh, like non-critical items like blood uh, BPI instruments or stethoscope, which are in contact with skin only, for those uh, low-level disinfectant like alcohol should be used for disinfection. For medium level in this uh, instruments like laryngoscope uh, and others, which are in contact with the mucous membrane, medium level disinfectant should be used like the battery ammonium compound. For high level, uh, for critical items like uh, uh, blade, surgical blades, and other others, which enter into the human body, for them strict sterilization should be done by steam sterilization or if you are another. Now, what are the evidence? What are the evidences? What are the evidences available for cleaning and disinfection? There should be documentation of the protocols in the HSU manual. There should be daily cleaning records and availability of spill management kit, staff cleaning records, and uh, safety data sheets records of all the chemicals used. <clears throat> so, 
what are the HIC 1B, 1B uh, standard of NBS to equipment cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization practices are included uh, in the HIC manual. This, now, what is the difference between disinfection and sterilization? Disinfection is a process where most microbes, except spores, are removed. Sterilization is a process where even the spores are, rem are removed. So, this is a basic difference between disinfection and sterilization. However, before our disinfection or sterilization, cleaning is very necessary. Prop First, the instrument needs to be cleaned before we go for disinfection and sterilization. Cleaning, we have many multi enzyme solutions which are probiotic, lyprotic, and others. Such cleaning solution can be commercial or available, can be used for cleaning before we move for cleaning and disinfection and sterilization. I repeat, I repeat again. This, or this is the uh, Spalding's classification of non-critical, semi-critical, and critical. Crit, uh, uh, critical includes all the surgical instruments. Semi-critical includes uh, uh, instruments that are in contact with the mucous membranes like endoscope and others. Non-critical includes infect, uh, instruments like BP instruments and stethoscope. Now, depending upon the Spalding's classification, disinfectants are categorized at either at the high, intermediate, and low. High-level disinfectants include brutal diad or orthopedal diad or parasitic acid. Brutal diode or formal diode are a high level disinfectants, but it is not recommended for use in healthcare setting because they are respiratory allergens or toxic or toxins also, or carcinogenic also. Hence, uh, also brutal dehyde, uh, which is commonly used in some healthcare settings for endoscopes and uh, bronchoscopes and uh, disinfection others, brutal dehyde is not active against atypical mycobacteria. Hence, in, uh, in an alternative to brutal dehyde is orthopedal dehyde or parasitic acid or hydrogen peroxide. The OPA is a common alternative against brutal diet, and it is advised to have an OPA in place of brutal diet for such semi-critical items like bronchoscope, endoscope, and others. And the other, other thing is intermediate level disinfectant. Intermediate level disinfectant includes sodium hypochlorite, which is commonly used for blood. It is a cheaper alternative, it is a cheaper alternative available for it can be used for blood spillage and others. Codeine, iodine, chlorazidine are intermediate level disinfectants. Low level disinfectant includes alcohol, benzene chloride, and soaps and others. I said before, disinfectant should be used based on the Spalding's classification. Now, CSSD stands for Central Sterile Supply Department. It is a service within a hospital scattering to all uh, the cleaning and disinfectant services in the hospital. Now, what is the object of a CSSD? Provide safe to use medical equipment to reduce the work burden. It's a centralized area for cleaning and disinfection to avoid duplication of expensive, uh, uh, expensive uh, cleaning and disinfection. Now, what is the object of CSSD? To maintain records of the instrument disinfected and sterilized, to contribute in reducing the infection rates, to maintain an inventory of supplies, to provide a safe environment for patient staff, and to keep up to date with the development and advances. What are the functions of CSSD? First, when equipment, uh, when contaminated equipment comes from OT or CATAB and other areas, first, it is cleaning. So, this are the first, this are, uh, first is cleaning. <coughs> Then after cleaning, there is a disinfection. Uh, this disinfection. Then after disinfection, the items are completely dried. Disinfection is done based on the Spalding's classification. Then after disinfection, the, the, the instruments are completely dried. Then inspected, the instruments and then inspected. Then assembly of the instruments are done. Uh, um, then after assembly of the instruments, it, the packing of the instruments are done. Then the packed instruments are then labeled. And then it undergoes sterilization. And then the sterilized items are stored in this separate sterile room. And then finally, it is distributed to the, uh, uh, dip, uh, in the, uh, to the rest of the departments. So these are the functions of a CSSD. In a CSSD too, it is ensured that uh, there is a zoning, means for, uh, for uh, disinfection or cleaning of the instruments, a uh, separate soil data is there for packing and uh, sterilization, a clean area is there. And for storing of the sterile items, there is just a sterile room. And it is ensured that the air flow is from clean to dirty, and there is a unidirectional flow of air and unidirectional flow of the staff there to avoid cross contamination of the air and the instruments. And it, is, it should be ensured that there should be compressed air in a CSSD, preferably HEPA filtered air should be there in the CSSD. It is a high risk, some of the highest area of the hospital. Then water with water with a low TDS. Uh, should be available should be available in CSSD. RO water is preferred for final rinse. Then uh, environmental control should be ensured that the temperature about 80 to 25 degrees Celsius, humidity about 40 to 60 percent, or and a negative uh, negative pressure is there uh, in a cleaning and decontamination area. 
and positive pressure is there in the storage area. This pressure requirement should also be followed. And since CSSD pressure gauges should be available to ensure that this negative and positive ventilation or uh, pressurization is maintained. And it is often also seen in, in, in my observation, the humidity often gets uh, increases to 70 to 80. That too should be avoided because the increased hemo humidity favors the growth of the organisms. So environmental control should be followed in CSSD department. Now, what are the evidences available, available uh, for CSSD for any requir for a requirement? That the packing material should be oven or non oven or peel pouches or paper or plastic or closed containers. Appropriate PP should be available. Packing appropriate packing material should be available. Availability of safety data set should be available. Periodic checks should be done of equipment monitoring, audits, and periodic training. Documentation should be available of the CSSD functions in, uh, for, uh, for records. For sterilization, it can, it can be either a steam sterilization or E2 sterilization or a plasma gas sterilization of parasitic acid or ozone and others. A steam sterilization is a sterilization at a temperature of 120 degrees Celsius for 13 minutes for a 15 pound pressure. It should be used for sterilizing only heat, heat stable item. Uh, now, what should, be the, what should be recorded in steam sterilization record? It's the sterilizer identification, the cycle number, the batch number, the date of sterilization, the temperature, the pressure, uh, and the signature of the CSSD technician. The batch record should be verified and the load authorized. Then it can happen that they really, we can require a recall, recall of the items too, and proper documentation should be maintained. ETO sterilization, the ETO meter, ETO is the gas which is, uh, which is released at an ambient temperature and pressure and used for sterilization. So typical temperature for ETO is about 37 to 55 degrees Celsius, and pressure is about one to one and a half kg per centimeter square. And a time is required is 2 to 120 minutes, and eight to 12 hours is required for aeration. ETA is a, is a toxic gas, so some eight to 12 hours is required for the aeration of ETO. ETO occurs by alkalization, and it is highly penetrating for which for items which are not heat stable, which 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 which, 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 does, which cannot be steam sterilized for them ETO is uh, ETO is used. And it should be seen that the process complies with the EPA requirements, that is, that is the Environmental Protection Agency requirements. ETO is not banned, but it should be followed as per, if it is used as per the manufacturer's instruction for use instructions, then it is safe to use. There are packages in this ECS, they must be stored only on stainless racks, it should not be stored on wooden racks. And there are specifications for racks too, that should be added. The shelf life of the sterilized items depends upon the method of sterilization. So that you can the hospital could have their own protocol, say for auto flow, they can have a six month or for ETO, they can have a two year. So the so the <coughs> so the, the shelf life should, should be should be there for each of the sterilized items. And the sterilized items should be dispatched on the first in and first out basis. Please note that the contents are sterile unless the package is open or damaged. So the package must be always checked before use. The sterility conditions and the microbial status of the process items must be regularly monitored. Monitoring should be done by physical indicators like temp temperature, pressure, time, and others. Chemical, uh, chemically, it should be uh, monitored by using chemical indicators like TST strips and others. And biologically, it should be monitored by using biological monitors like uh, the uh, stereothermophilus vials. different chemical indicators like for uh, we have type 1 2 3 4 5 6 indicators uh, depending upon the uh, depending upon the sterilization process the different indicators can be used so for example for the implant we can use an either an integrating indicator with a biological indicator biological indicator dip, uh, dip, uh, is, uh, is a type 2 indicator for implants i like to go into detail for uh, for releasing an implant for only biological indicator results can be used to release implant Every sterilization load containing implant should be monitored with a process challenge device containing a BI, that is a biologic indicator. So for implant, I repeat again, by a, a class five integrating chemical indicator should be included in a process challenge device. Uh, a process challenge device means uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like a, it's a, we have a, 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 a uh, it's a commercial available also process challenge device when we are indicating uh, class five candy indicator that can be used all over the biologic indicator for implants. Implants should be quarantined until the results of BI that is biologic indicator testings are available. Before that, implants should, should not be released. Releasing implants before the BI results 
are unacceptable. It should be an exception, but not the rule. Now regarding reprocessing uh, uh, protocol, it should add up to the ISO protocol, uh, 1348527. Single use device is a device that is marketed for, for single patient use. It should not be marketed or labeled with uh, reusing the device in another patient. What are the principles for uh, reusable devices? I identify uh, the, the hospital should have a protocol for identification of reprocessing times of single use. For some as you do, it is not possible to use it for a single use. So there should be protocol as, as per uh, for reprocessing of the items. Labeling the SUD that is single use with the name of the device, the specification should be should be followed. Not reusing the original packaging materials for the manage uh, original packaging materials should not be for the manufacturer. Obtaining the consent for use of a single use should be done from the patients and it should be documented. Allocation of a batch number to the device should be done in order to facilitate a recall, as said before. <laughs> as I said before, uh, regarding recall, whenever there is a sterilization for failure, we go for the recall of the items. The condition where instruments or equipment are returned to the CSSD is a recall. If this is done, when the biologic indicator shows a bacterial growth, when it is wet inside the package, or when there is no color change in the chemical indicator, or if the SUD is found to be unsafe, then there is a recall done. So recall, whenever recall is done, it should, it should be documented for, for any uh, uh, observation. Also. So what is the evidence on part of CSSD record for any base? Is the documentation of the disinfection and sterilization practices should be done in the HSC manual. <coughs> Daily records of sterilization processes, quality check of the sterilization process, recall register should be available. And the process documentation should be available in recorded and in patient files. As you do, uh, the processing, if done, it should be recorded in patient files. And then the staff training records should be available and safety data sheets of all the chemicals used in the CSD should be available. It should add to the CDC ME guidelines and ORM guidelines. Now, this was about the CSD. We have seen standard precaution, transmission based precaution, sharp pick of protocol, and CSD. Now, the linear management. Linen management is an organized approach to managing the laundry and linen in an efficient and cost-effective manner. NABS standard, uh, NABS entry level standard HIC 1E uh, gives details about laundry and linen management practices. Now the functions of the laundry department are collect the soil linen, sorting the linen, inspecting it for uh, repairing or replacement uh, damaged materials, distributing the clean linen to different departments and maintaining registers. From laundry point of view, hospital linen can be classified into either dirty linen, soil linen, or infected linen. Dirty linen are the, without any stains, soil linen are with blood and body fluids, and infected are linen used by a patient with a known infection. Remember to sort the linen as wet and dry linen. The soil linen should be packed placed in a water impermeable laundry bag. The bag must be secured with three-fourth fill. The bag must be covered and left in a secure place for pickup and transport. And beware of the risk of laundry workers from sharp objects. Often in the root cause analysis of sharp injuries is often seen that the laundry people, laundry workers are often get injuries from the sharp instruments of a linen. So that should be avoided. The, lawn, the, the staff handling the soil linen should be educated on the correct method of sorting the linen wearing PPE while sorting the linen and being instructed to minimize handling wet linen. Heavily soiled linen should be pre-soaked in soap water and bleach for that so, uh, bleach for 20 minutes. 20 minutes is the contact time required for the disinfection of the linen by bleach. Warm water must be used. 1% sodium hypochlorite should be added as a bleach to decontaminate the soil linen. Disinfection of the thermal, is this one kind of thermal disinfection, the temperature of the load should be maintained at a minimum of 65 degrees Celsius for not less than 10 minutes, or a maximum of 71 degrees Celsius for, third, for not less than three minutes. Washing. Now, the step involved in washing of linen are heavily soiled linen should be washed separately from non soiled linen. 
and the temperature and the time cycle should be adjusted according to the instructions and type of washing product. Both cold and hot water cycles that can include bleach helps in reducing the bacterial counts in the linen. What happens in a hot water washing of the linen? The hot water about 71 degrees Celsius and soap is used to aid in loosening the soil and the organic matter. Uh, and a, a mild acid agent like a sour can be added to prevent yellowing of the linen if desirable. The, when the wash cycle is complete, the linen should be checked for cleanliness. It should be rewashed if it is dirty or stained. Clean linen should be stored and transported separately uh, to avoid contamination. So that there should be a separate uh, transport container for clean linen and separate for dirty linen. The linen that it was sterilized should be wrapped accordingly. Unused linen should be reprocessed after three months. It is important to conduct a quality check at every stage of the linen management process. The laundry, laundry is outsourced, then there should be an established system for contract management and periodic review of the quality of the outsourced service. Evidence is available for any basic goods. The documentation of the laundry management in the HIC manual, the daily washing records, the staff training records, the, the PPE issues by staff handling the linen and SDS safety data sheets. And if it is outsourced, then the MOU, that is the Memorandum of under, uh, Understanding. MO should be available if it's out. So that was our uh, laundry and linen. I uh, request I uh, request the uh, participants to have a um, to to have a five minutes break. We'll have a we'll have a five minutes break. Request for a five minutes break and let's rejoin. Don't uh, don't leave the uh, link, please.
hello uh, so, uh, so let's rejoin again and uh, thanks to the participants for the uh, for the cooperation and the kind attention so we we were uh, we were we were on the uh, out to the kitchen sanitation and food handling <clears throat> regarding kitchen sanitation kitchen sanitation please note that kitchen is also one of the high risk high risk area of the hospital the diet <clears throat> the dietary staff should ensure that hand hygiene is done stringently before starting work and should be repeated at several instances such as after using a toilet after touching the equipments and after handling raw food see most of the healthcare infections in an health setting occurs because of uh, gram negative organisms like e coli and klebsiella in developing countries like in india and e coli klebsiella are part of intestinal flora hence strict hand hygiene should be done after especially after toilet use wearing clean clothes using hair nets while on duty by the, by the kitchen staff uh, and wearing gloves use of clean equipment for preparing or storing food should be strictly adhered <clears throat> uncooked food items should be maintained at the temperature of 2 to 8 degrees celsius or below raw meat and fish should be stored in a freezer maintained between 18 to 20 degrees celsius first expire first out or first in first out stock retention system should be applied while using food from refrigerator color coding the uh, cutting boards knives and utensils helps in preventing the cross contamination of food for example you can use a green color items for chopping and storing vegetables you can have yellow color for raw poultry which helps in preventing cross contamination this is often uh, most in the settings this is often not followed but it should be strictly uh, it should be is advised is recommended to prevent cross contamination of foods <clears throat> the kitchen should be well lit and have a good ventilation and access to water supply kitchen i repeat again kitchen is a high risk area so the temp proper temperature pressure and humidity should be equally followed in a clean kitchen there are separate standards also for kitchen like for ot we uh, the so that's the such kind of just condition should be maintained for a clean environment clean cooking uh, in a kitchen after preparation the food should be assembled in food trays the food trays should be sent to various areas of consumption in dedicated clean closed food trolleys having individual racks which facilitate to maintain the desired temperature the food trolley should be covered during transportation kitchen waste should be segregated into dry and wet waste and disposed into the respective bins in case of a food borne illness outbreak say typhoid or uh, typhoid or cholera and others the infection control team should be notified about the outbreak microbiology department should obtain specimen from the symptomatic individuals and from the suspected food also hic team should investigate the outbreak for the surveillance ensure that such happen doesn't happen outbreak water analysis should be done once in a month screening of the food handlers for the carrier state of uh, enteric pathogen should be done by annually all dietary staff should be given a typhoid vaccine and hepatitis a vaccine hepatitis a vaccine is optional but is the best practice <clears throat> that was about the kitchen let's move to the engineering controls to prevent infections engineering controls also because they they, they are the backbones or the covering for for, uh, for our uh, infection control in the hospital setting engineering controls are important for preventing infection it is their role is very crucial in maintenance of hvac system that is heating ventilation and air condition system water supply building and the supply lines basic requirements for environmental controls include water management ot management ot management of the high risk areas like ot cath lab protecting environmental rooms and facility management what regarding water water management <clears throat> general requirements for pipelines are the proper color coding of the different pipelines like drinking water or the ro line or the fire pipelines and the sewage water lines should be followed 
and there should be up to date drawings of the pipelines general requirements for water tanks are cleaning schedule should be followed for water tanks uh, endotoxin testing of the ro water should be done at least uh, every 3 months and the hic team uh, uh, should ensure that the endotoxin levels done of the ro water should should be uh, should be at a within a normal range say 2.5 units is the is the normal range for endotoxin so the, the endotoxin of the water content water uh, tested should not be more than 2.5 unit if it is more than 2.5 it indicates that endotoxins are released endotoxins are components of gram negative bacteria like e coli bacteria so if the endotoxins rises in the water it indicates an infection <coughs> contaminated water which is a risk for outbreak in the hospital so water should be tested for endotoxin every 3 monthly records of the date of cleaning disinfectant use the name of the person who cleaned the tank should be done the water tank should be kept closed should be marked with the details regarding the type of water tank the last cleaning date and the due date should have water level indicator and should have safe access to the ladder to the water tank <clears throat> proper color coding of different pipelines like drinking water ro line should be done physical testing of the drink water order should be done daily which includes color order and taste that is a physical testing chemical testing should be done for, from an enable accredited facility at least once in 6 months the biological testing should be done said said before once every month by the micro department the alternate sources of water like bore well or tanker water or well uh, other uh, should be in, kept as a backup in case of water start, shortage which should all be checked once every 6 months to ensure that the sewage from the hospital is treated appropriately and dose does not pose uh, does not pose in danger the physical quality of the water should be checked daily the chemical quality should be checked once in 6 months and biological quality every month then sewage treatment should be if there is a sewage treatment plan the limit should be as per the pollution control board the physical quality should be checked daily as said before chemical quality once in 6 months and biological quality every monthly an entry level hospital the best practice for analyzing drinking water is once in a month checking the residual chlorine levels of the ro water for dialysis should be done after the weekly cleaning of uh, at the terminal ends before creating to the machine endotoxin levels should be done it is say it is recommended once in a month but at least caught every 3 months should be done scrub water should be checked once a week the theta environment should have zoning done appropriately entry level and three should be restricted the patient should not be brought beyond the red line in a theater and transfer trolleys should be used the theater staff should wear proper attire ot walls and floors should be free of any crevices and cracks it is wooden wooden board should be avoided uh, because it can it can, it can the crevices in the wooden can pose as a risk of infection the floor should be scamless and with curved edges the floor should be with the curved edges they should prevent the accumulation of dirt on organisms and should be very easy to clean cleaning records should be maintained of the theater and ot theaters now regarding the air conditioning in theater it is mandatory for a fully enabled accreditation to have a following in ot individual hair handling unit for each theater laminar flow and highly and hepa filters that like, that is highly efficient particulate air filters in each of in case in case of ultra clean theaters so hepa filters should be available and a laminar flow in case of ultra clean theaters like because of uh, like for a transplant ots and others so for them hepa and the laminar flow is required individual air handling is required for each theater air changes press positive pressure uh, ventilation relative humidity and temperature should be monitored temperature should be below temperature should be between, should be around 20 to 24 degrees celsius, celsius, celsius because the lower the temperature less than 18 is a, is a risk for a high uh, um, uh, is again a risk while higher temperature is again a risk so the poor the extreme the temperature is a risk for infection so the temperature should be between 20 to 24 humidity should be between 30 to 60 percent and the positive pressure that is as least two and a half pascal should be there uh, pressure should be there in the uh, ot room and air changes at least 12 air changes per hour should be maintained in an ot so air changes means air changes per hour means the uh, the volume of the number of times the volume of the entire room gets replaced every hourly so the air changes per hour of an ot should be at least 12 and that should be maintained the air conditioner system should not be switched off and should be maintained with a variable frequency devices and a blower to prevent spore formation in the ducts so the ac system should be provided a blower prevent spore formation in the ducts now the ac ducts 
should at least be cleaned every six monthly. Uh, and the pre-filters of the HEPA filter, HEPA filter should at least be cleaned every two weekly to prevent such spore formation or airborne con air airborne infections uh, transmission. <clears throat> I said before, the HEPA should be cleaned if the particle count is high. HEPA should be regularly checked every at least every six monthly. Then the integrity of the HEPA filters and the system should be checked every six monthly. Uh, the pre-filters should be washed every weekly or at least every two weekly and ma should be maintained appropriately. Records of this checking should be available, should be maintained for the records for accreditation for visits. For entry level certification of hospital, the split AC system and the window AC are permitted in theaters. But the filters of the window AC should be cleaned weekly and uh, should be maintained. It should be maintained weekly, and the process should be documented. <clears throat> the protective environment rooms, like burn units, transplant units, and isolation units, should be planned and considered as per the norms. Air condition requirements, like positive pressure in case of transplant or the burn units, and negative pressure in case of isolation units, should be provided. So uh, there are two types of ventilation. One is positive ventilation. So the uh, patients with uh, immunosuppressed or immunocompromised like HIV patients or a patient with a transplant or with a burn infection, they should be kept in a positive pressure ventilation room. The, wherein uh, the air from the patient room goes outside, but the outside air doesn't come into the patient rooms because the patients are highly susceptible to infection. So for such immunosuppressed patients, positive ventilation should be provided. While for patients who are already infected, they should be isolated into a negative ventilation room. <coughs> What what are the what are the what are the what are the uh, isolation requirements? <coughs> if the isolation units are not available in the hospital and the patient with the airborne infection are admitted, then then uh, uh, the, then to prevent the spread of infection, each patient should be placed in the single private rooms with closed doors. Patient with the same illness can be placed in the same room. That cohorting can be done. For example, if there are patient number of patients with MRC infection, then they, they can be then can be courted if rooms are not single rooms are not available. <coughs> there should be no central AC supply in, in any rooms. Each room should have a separate AC unit for isolation. <coughs> now, what are the isolation requirements? The door should be kept shut, windows should be open, uh, inlet and outlet AC that should be blocked. Powerful exhaust airflow uh, should be available from outside to inside the room, uh, in and out through the window, and when the door is open. So that was about the isolation requirements, engineering controls. So what are the guidelines for the mortuary? <coughs> often this is the area which is often uh, uh, neglected. But the, what are the requirements? A separate area should be designated uh, for a mortuary and should be under a lock and key with strict access control. The facilities should be clean and it should have a cold storage with temperature monitoring and a power backup. <coughs> the mortuary staff should perform hand hygiene and wear adequate PPE. The biomedical waste should be safely segregated and disposed. The mortuary should be free of paste and rodents and the entire process should be documented. Coming, to the biomedical, coming back to the biomedical waste, that was about the mortuary. The HIC 3 standard of NABH entry levels gives a guideline for biomedical waste management practices to be followed. So what is a biomedical waste? As I said before, 5% uh, uh, of hospital waste are about uh, biomedical. So to prevent the mixing of the 5%, the rest of the 95% non infectious uh, proper segregation should be followed and the guidelines should be followed for, uh, for uh, segregation, storage, collection, storage, and transport of biomedical waste. Now, what is a biomedical waste? It is any waste which is generated during the diagnosis, treatment, or humanization of human beings or animals or in research activities pertaining thereto. In short, in simple words, any waste which is generated during the patient care is a biomedical waste. The biomedical waste can cause health problems to the healthcare professionals who handle it and pollute the environment as well. So proper collection, storage, transport, and disposal of the biomedical waste is important. To minimize the risk of infections. So there are three approaches to biomedical waste management. One is reduce, then second reuse and recycle. What is reduce? Prevent the wastage of products. So, so as far as possible, efforts should be there to prevent the wastage of the products in a healthcare setting. Then 
stress should be there uh, focus should be there that reuse the single use item after proper sterilization mm -hmm. then recycle send the non hazardous item for recycling the hospital is authorized it should be ensured that the hospital is authorized by prescribing authority for the management and the handling of biomedical waste <laughs> The statutory, the statutory requirement uh, the statutory requirement uh, is that the healthcare organization must possess a NOC from state pollution control board for generating storage and transport of biomedical waste. The guidelines and the code of practice for managing biomedical waste are uniform for hospitals, veterinary institutions, animal houses, pathology labs, and others. Remember that the biomedical waste rules of 2006 do not apply to radioactive waste or the hazardous chemical waste or solid waste or lead acid batteries uh, rules or hazardous waste management or uh, e-waste and uh, uh, hazardous microorganisms rules. The, the biomedical waste rules 2016, one it defines, defines occupier, operator, the prescribed authority and the control committee. What is an occupier as per the rules? It is uh, the administration of a healthcare facility or the operator who runs the common treatment, fa treatment facility. Who are the prescribed authority? The authority is the state pollution control board in respect of a state and a pollution. Then control com control committee that is the respect of a union territory. So there are these are the different uh, these are the definitions of the as per biomedical waste. Now what should be the evidences for hospitals uh, as per HIC 3A and base standards for biomedical waste? That is it should include first authorization for generating biomedical waste. Then second, outsource vendor license for collecting waste. Then MOU for treatment for the for the biomedical waste. HSC 3B standard of NMB state that proper segregation and collection and segregation of biomedical waste from all the patient carriers of the hospitals is implemented and monitored. <laughs> what are the examples of this biomedical waste? It includes chemical waste, infectious waste, sharp waste, solid oxygen waste, and infected waste. Let's see how that's segregated. Uh, of, of, uh, all, if you can see if from the slide, uh, the yellow and the red beans and the blue beans and the started oxygen beans and the waste containers carry a biohazard symbol. <clears throat> so the biomedical waste should be segregated into the beans with such biohazard symbols. <clears throat> While the general waste like paper and tissue waste, the kitchen waste, the water bottles and the cans should be segregated into green color coated beans or any other beans as per the hospital's protocols. However, the infected plastics uh, should, uh, which, which, uh, should be segregated uh, like syringes or gloves and the plastic waste should be segregated into red beans. The infected waste like soiled anatomical chemical liquid and laboratory waste should be segregated into yellow beans. To make things simpler, any things which can be burned go, goes into yellow beans like cap, mask, <coughs> cotton pieces, gauze pieces, goes into yellow beans. Things that cannot be burned like rubber and plastic things like tubings, catheters like IV tubes, rice tubes, endotracheal tubes, gloves, goes into red, red beans. Here, uh, note to, to, to the listeners that uh, blood bag goes into the yellow, yellow bean while the vacuum tunnels goes into the red bean. This is often a non-compliance raised in as per the segregation of this type of, of this particular waste. A cytotoxic waste, I hope the difference is clear with, about the segregation. Cytotoxic waste into cytotoxic bean with the cytotoxic label, expired or the discarded medicines or tablets should be discarded, should be, should be segregated. Now for the glass waste, like antibiotic vials, metabolic, uh, metallic implants, the glass waste of reagent bottles, and all the materials, except the cytotoxic, goes into blue beans. If you refer to the, uh, uh, the biomedical waste rules, recently uh, it's seen that even the glass slides should be also to be discarded into the blue uh, blue beans with the biomedical symbol. So that was about the segregation of the red, yellow, and the blue and the cytotoxic waste uh, beans. Now, any any waste that can cause sharp injury goes into the a white container with a bio with a with a uh, bio, with a bio symbol. The white container should be puncture proof, uh, puncture proof uh, and resistant uh, puncture proof con container. Uh, 
and with when it is a uh, two dot two dot fill it should it should be it should be sealed and this and, and should be sent for treatment mm -hmm. So, so to repeat to summarize again, yellow category beans include uh, waste like anatomy, human and breaker waste, soil waste like the uh, uh, goth pitches, uh, cotton, uh, cotton plugs, soil linen and laundry waste, uh, beddings, animal anatomical waste, if, uh, blood bags, uh, microbiology waste, and laboratory waste. All this waste goes into yellow beans. Uh, however, it is then pre treatment, the yellow beans are pre treatment with autoclave, that is the steam sterilization in an autoclavable bag. Which is non chlorinated, it's a bag of 50 microns at least. And then it is uh, stored, it is transferred to a low containers with a other symbol. A low category also includes waste like discarded medicines, cytotoxic drugs, items contaminated with cytotoxic drugs, liquid waste from OT cat lab, floor wastings, infected secretions, discarded disinfectants also. They are pre treated with 1% hypochlorite solution and then discarded into the uh, in segregated in a low bag of 50 microns, non chlorinated, and a low beans. Red category waste includes waste like uh, tubing, uh, plastic and rubber things like tubing, catheters, bottles, uh, bottles, plastic bottles, uh, 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 infected plastic bottles, gloves, even soiled gloves, uh, syringes, vacuum, vacuum cleaners, uh, and urine bags goes into red red containers. Red urine bags goes into red bags, while the blood bags goes into the yellow bag. Please note the difference. The syringes uh, without needles will go into red bag, but the syringes with needles will go into Sharp containers. Mutilation of this red uh, red color coated uh, uh, waste of uh, red bag uh, their first put uh, cutting mutilated during the reuse and then it is discarded into segregated into non chlorinated bag of 50 microns at least. In the blue category, these are the waste which consists of broken glass, glass slides also, medicine vials, contaminated antibiotic vials, contaminated glass, ampoules, meta metallic implants. So they are discarded into blue beans with a biohazard symbol. To, uh, now to the sharp containers with the bar with the bar higher symbol uh, all the sharps like sharp items uh, like many needles scalpels bloods burn needles syringes with thick needles are discarded with a sharp container with a bar that's simple uh, it's better that the sharp containers are are car carries a flap to prevent uh, to prevent any inju in injuries now 80 percent of as said before now 80 to 85 percent of the hospital waste are general waste and it includes waste like, uh, waste like paper, food items, wrappings, and so on. So they should be discarded into beans, which are which are which, without a biohazard symbol, like a green beans that you can see from the picture. Now, before transporting the items, the bags should be uh, labeled. They can, can be, uh, recently, they, it has been mandatory to have a barcoded uh, label to the bags, which will include the day of tra the, the transporting, the month, the year, the date of generation, the waste category number, the waste quantity, the sender's address, the receiver's address, and other details. So that that labeling should be done. Biohazard symbol should be should be strictly on the beans or respectively. A biohazard symbol or a status labels according to respective bags. While transporting the biomedical waste across a hospital, a healthcare professional should wear a prop will wear PPE, personal property equipment. To be best be aware of the best practices for the spill management. Never overload the trolley. Then use closed trolleys for transporting the biomedical waste. Waste should not be stored beyond a period of 14 hours. So waste should be periodically removed at every uh, intervals of 14 hours. Biomedical waste should be transported one to only in a lorry or a truck that has a global positioning system enabled in it. So the GPS system should be um, should be available or uh, should be should, should be the lorry or the, 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 the vehicle should be equipped with a global position a GPS system for to track the biomedical waste. <clears throat> the biomedical waste is generated, segregated, and stored in a hospital. It is then transported to a common biomedical waste treatment facility for disposal. At every stage, a record of the work done should be maintained for future reference. And maintaining records of the quantity of the waste is important in all the uh, uh, settings. Now, what are the uh, recent amended rules says that the occupier of the uh, healthcare units shall maintain and update on day-to-day -day basis the waste management register. 
all bedded healthcare units shall display the monthly record of the waste management on its website. Such healthcare facilities shall make the annual report also available on the website. The healthcare facilities having less than 10 beds should also have to comply with the discharge standard for liquid waste uh, as per the recent rules. Monitoring of the biomedical waste audit form to be done. A hospital can devise its own audit form for biomedical waste management. As you can see from this picture, the biomedical waste management audit form can include whether the posters are the BMW posters are displayed or not, whether color coded beans are available, if the red beans are available, whether non-perinated auto label bags are used for treatment or disinfection whether infected materials are properly segregated, uh, whether all the beans are available, whether one person sodium hypochlorite solution is available for disseminated liquid waste before discarding to the septic drain. So, 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 such audit form should include the details uh, for, uh, for the respective departments for auditing of the biomedical waste. <clears throat> so what are the evidences that is required for the HSC 3 b NAB standard for, the, for biomedical waste management? One is, documentation of the biomedical waste practices in the HIC manual. Then second, appropriate color of coded beans are available. Posters for, in, for instructions of the health, for a, uh, ready access, for uh, instruction to the healthcare personnel should be available in the healthcare setting, wherever, at least in the, in the areas where the biomedical waste is segregated. And the staff training records of biomedical waste management should be available. And the audits done for the biomedical waste management should be also available. Uh, for the records for any based audits. Now, what does HSA 3C uh, standard of any base says? It says that the biomedical waste treatment facility is managed as per statutory provisions if in house or outsourced to authorized contractors. What are the statutory requirements? The treatment facility where biomedical waste is finally treated before disposal should be authorized by State Pollution Control Board. The state, repeat the treatment facility where the biomedical is finally treated. Where we, we outsource it to, the, to some agencies for the treatment. If, if, they also, if it, such agencies are also, it should be ensured by the, by the, by the healthcare setting that they are, the such agencies are authorized by Pollution Control Board. And to ensure that there's a common uh, treatment facility available, such as incinerators or, or a high attack or out of play available for the treatment of biomedical waste. What are the evidences that the hospital follows the uh, has, uh, of this standard uh, that is NA, HSA 3C? This is license to operate, which is regularly updated, and site visit record. So the site visit to the, uh, the treatment facility, the site visit, the audit of the site visit record should be available uh, as an evidence for uh, compliance to this HSA 3C NAB standard. What is HSA 3D standard says? The requisite fees. The documents and reports are submitted to the competent authorities on stipulated dates. So this record should be available for uh, for the NAP uh, as per this uh, standard. The hospital should submit the following forms: uh, accident reporting form, the application for authorization or renewal the, uh, for all authorization, the annual report, the application for filing appeals. This five forms should be available for with the hospital for uh, as per the NAP standard. I repeat again: the accident reporting, authorization application, authorization annual report, and the filing appeal application. The hospital should report any incidents such as fire hazards of the blast or toppling of the truck carrying biomedical waste or accident release of the biomedical waste in any water body. Such such incidents should be reported by hospitals. To, uh, the hospital doesn't have to report accidents like needle stick injuries and mercury spills. <clears throat> the evidence is that the hospital has followed the HSC 3D NMB standards are the forms, the records of waste generated, and the monthly updation in the website. So what does HSC 3E standard says that appropriate personal protective measures are used by all categories of the staff who are handling the biomedical waste. All the healthcare personnel handling biomedical waste should wear 
personal protective equipment like cap, mask, goggles, apron, goggles, and uh, gloves, and boots. After handling the biomedical waste, a healthcare personnel should perform hand hygiene without fit. So hand hygiene should be strictly added. It is often it is often seen in the root cause analysis of infects healthcare associated infection that while doing handling the biomedical waste, they, uh, there, uh, there is a poor compliance for wearing PPE, especially the gloves, and hence the housekeeping staff or the cleaning staff gets gets the uh, infections uh, healthcare associated infections. What are the evidences that are available that, 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 that the hospital has followed uh, for has followed for HSC and MBA standard are availability of personal protective equipment and then the staff training on PPE usage and hand washing. Staff training records should be available. The PPE stock should be available. Then the audit of the PPE usage while handling the BMW base should be available. And the, and the, the NAB people, the NAB can interview the staff for the awareness among the staff about biomedical waste management also. The point should remember all healthcare professionals handling the biomedical waste should be vaccinated against hepatitis B virus and tetanus. They should undergo regular health checkup and training at least once in a year. And those records are often should be available, are often checked by the NABH SSS while, while during their audits. The hospital having more than 30 beds should have a hospital waste management committee. So waste hospital waste management committee should be uh, should, should be there in a healthcare setting when hospitals have more than 30 beds. So that was all in detail about the hospital waste. <clears throat> uh, I request the participants to put down their questions into the chat box. We'll move to the another another uh, another section uh, another uh, uh, section of the to the same that is antibody policy. <clears throat> We will have a 15 to 20 minute discussion at the end of the CME for, uh, for uh, issues related to, for any queries related to inflation control. Now, antibiotic policy to be right, uh, or it's a subject of my, my passion. So, we'll, let's, let's see. <clears throat> Antimicrobial resistance can be can be can be can be, can be said as a silent clear pandemic going on. For everyone's information, the re and resistance. See, and when a patient gets infected, comes to a casualty, and uh, the, the, the clinician is unaware of its infectious status, um, uh, uh, about its about its sensitivity antibodies to be given. Then the, the empirical therapy is given. That is, we, we don't know about the sensitivity of sensitivity to antibodies and empirical therapy is given. And in, in this empirical therapy, the mostly common antibodies given are the cephalosporins or the carbapenem. But for everyone's information here, the resistance of you know, this cephalosporins is that which is also called as uh, uh, is due to an uh, uh, resistant gene called as X, it can be called as X, ESBL resistance, that is extended spectrum beta lactamase resistance. And the prevalence of this ESBL resistance or this cephalosporin resistance is uh, ranges to about 60 to 80 percent. In, uh, in India. So it, it, there are more chances of the empirical therapy getting failed. And that is what is, we call called as antimicrobial resistance. Even if the empirical therapy is given by higher uh, antibodies like carbapenems, like amipenem, meropenem, even the resistance against these carbapenems, the prevalence is about 30 to 50 percent in India. So there are more chances of failure of empirical therapy by cephalus or carbapenems in a country like India. And this problem is very serious. It's it's it's, it's, uh, it's it's called it's a serious. Uh, hence, to control this, uh, prevent and control this uh, global. This is glo this uh, issue is global. To prevent and control this antimicrobial resistance, uh, we uh, we need to we it's an urgency. We need to follow strict uh, strategies in the healthcare setting to prevent this resistance. And this strategies, the uh, the bunch of these strategies, we of uh, comes under a program called antimicrobial stewardship. So about resistance, the globally there is a rise in the infection by multidrug resistant organisms. At, at a time, MRS and VRE was used to be very, uh, very rare. But in the recent times, especially in the COVID pandemic, and the, uh, the, uh, the prevalence of MRS and VRE has shooted significantly. It has increased more than three to four times. 
often uh, uh, often uh, also there is a, there is a patient gets infected by rare pathogens like elizabeth and uh, burkholderian canada oris which used to be very very rare at times so if you take an example of just burkholderia it uh, it's a very highly uh, or take an example of canada oris uh, it's a, it's a it's a canada oris often causes outbreaks in healthcare settings and it is a very difficult to treat infection if you take example of vre vre is uh, resistance to Uh, or the beta lactam and, and, and antibiotics is, and it's sensitive is uh, one of the treatment option again vr is vancomycin picoprene or linezolid so even if you take elizabeth the options we may option available are vanco pico lino uh, and uh, others so there, there are more the prevalence of this patients uh, infection due to such rare pathogens which is uh, has increased significantly and they are resistant and very difficult to treat and since it is a global emergency to control the antimicrobial Resistance. Most of the current antibodies are slight modification of the existing drugs, and there is lack of new antibodies. The, 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 in the pipeline, we have very less antibodies, or the pipeline has dried up now because because of, because of the immediate development of resistance against the newly uh, invented uh, antibodies. Uh, the, 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 the antibodies are not into uh, take the into the market or uh, the, the healthcare industry because of the immediate resistance issue. So, how can the healthcare sector combat this resistance? Minimize the spread of uh, multi-drug resistance. organism resistance and health uh, should be uh, should be strictly followed uh, to prevent the epidemics of the existing antibodies every hospital should have its own antibody policy now for this policy we need to have an antibiogram uh, every hospital be uh, uh, if, 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 they, if it is not feasible to have an antibiogram uh, the, the hospital uh, the, the, uh, the, the departments of the clinical department uh, heads Uh, can follow the treatment guidelines for antimicrobial use as per the national antibiotic policy we can see from the slide uh, the we have a national antibiotic policy uh, according to the uh, antibiogram of most of the healthcare setting of the, of the country we have national antibiotic policy that can be followed if uh, if, uh, if the healthcare setting doesn't have their own antibiotic policy the antibiotic policy uh, gives guidelines for right for right bug for a right drug that means about right drug to be used as a particular infection for a particular setting the board policy is essential for prophylaxis for empirical therapy and definitive therapy and the, uh, the the clinician the healthcare the clinician should strictly adhere to the antibody policy of a healthcare uh, setting uh, stringently if you want to prevent and control the antimicrobial resistance issue so every hospital should have their own antibody policy based on the local antibiogram antibiogram to uh, to explain is the re, uh, is the uh, is the pattern of the uh, sensitivity of the anti uh, of the organism of the commonly prevalent organisms of the healthcare setting against commonly prescribed antibiotics so antibiogram can be prepared manually or it can be uh, your, your, the or it can be your, even uh, calculated or prepared by using a software like hunet and others so antibiogram should be prepared by every healthcare setting and based on and their antibiogram antibiotic policy should be framed so there should be periodic review also once an antibiotic policy is framed there should be periodic review at least every yearly uh, antibiotic policy should be reviewed and, and, and updated the, the, the treatment guidelines the national antibiotic guidelines for the uh, uh, can be can be used as a guiding document <laughs> Now, what is the aim of the antibody policy? The primary aim of the antimicrobial policy should be to minimize the mortality due to antibiotic resistant infection, and preserve the effectiveness of the existing antimicrobial agents. This can be achieved by selecting and uh, patients who needs to be treated, uh, uh, having all the antibodies available, available, and avoiding the unnecessary antibiotic use. That is to have a right drug or antimicrobial uh, right drug for the right bug. what is the basis of antibody policy the antibody policy should be based on the spectrum of antibody activity it should be based on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic the adverse effects the potential to cause resistance the cost and the special needs of the patient groups like uh, uh, the special needs of the patient groups i said before know your local antibiogram every hospital should have their own antibiogram and the hospitals drug and the therapeutic committee should divide their hospital antibody policy based on their antibiogram there should be a stewardship committee uh, and stewardship program uh, in a healthcare setting which refer to coordinated interventions that are designed 
to improve and measure the appropriate use of antimicrobials in a hospital. Uh, Antimicro antimicrobial stewardship program consists of con includes some strategies uh, for uh, to, to, mo to monitor the, uh, the rational use of antimicrobials and prevent resistance. One of two of the such strategies include having a formulary restriction, uh, means only antimicrobials of the hospital formulary should be so used. Then pre authorization, the higher higher antibiotics should should be restricted or reserved. For, for clinical use, and if they want, you still need to be given in a certain case, exceptional cases, then it should be, it should be justified with a proper culture and sensitive report, and and uh, the justification should be given to the, to the uh, antimicrobial stewardship committee before prescribing. Uh, then monitoring of the antimicrobials, especially with the high end antibiotics like carbapenem, cholestine, tigacycline, and others, should be monitored in terms of defined daily doses. And the feedback should be given about its consumption to the clinics, to the, to the user department. So that was about the uh, antimicrobial stewardship program. Uh, request to all the participants: Let's uh, let's again. I have a five minutes break, and we'll return back and rejoin. <laughs>
Uh, so let's uh, let's rejoin. Till now uh, we have covered standard precaution, transmission based precautions, antibody policy, biomedical waste stop, and other. We'll uh, we have discussion at the end. Uh, and thanks to the participants for the kind attention. Till now uh, we have still one uh, one and a half hour uh, remaining. We we'll have fifteen twenty minutes uh, discussion too. So moving towards outbreak investigation. What is what is what is what is an outbreak? Outbreak means the occurrence of infections at a rate greater than the expected within a specific geographical area and over a period. So when we when when we for example when we have two or more infections, say for from a particular organism, say burpol diarrhea, from a particular department, say from dialysis department. And uh, then, in in uh, in, uh, in accord, uh, then we call is uh, as an outbreak. So any uh, infection in excess of the prevalent rate is called as an outbreak. In a specific geographical area, like in this example, we had a dialysis. Like like in the example, like for for a period, say within a week, we got two to three blood cultures positive from burpal diarrhea uh, from particular organism, from particular group of patients, from particular geographic area. If there is a increase in the infections more than the uh, uh, current prevalent rate, then we call it as an outbreak. Now, before going to the, the, the how to investigate an outbreak, let us just, uh, let us understand about a few details about uh, uh, how, about how to interpret the outbreaks. Now, for this, we need to know what is an epidemic curve. Now, epidemic curve it is a curve. That shows the progression. If you, see, if you can see from the slide, the epidemic curve is a curve that shows the progression of a disease over 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 a period of over a period of time. Now, the shape of the curve helps in understanding the nature of the disease and it is mode of transmission. <clears throat> as as you can see from from the from the slide, uh, as you can see from the slide, from the, if there is a one set of an epidemic, say there are two or more infections, 
from from particular day say day from day say from day zero and over a particular and over a particular day, uh, day days let's say for about four to five days if the, there is a rise in the cases and it is get, get decreased within these five days then it means that, that there is a common source that was that was responsible for this uh, epidemic for example cholera cholera can there is a common source for cholera in to contaminated contaminated water so in such case we have a such peak uh, of uh, such peak of, such such epidemic curve if it is a, 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 a continuous transmission say from day zero over a couple of days say till to day 12 uh, from host to host there is a transmission say from patient to patient patient to staff and staff to patient if the, there is outbreak continues like in example we had in covid 19 like we had in swine flu such uh, then the epidemic curve looks like looks 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 like like in, like in the given picture so there in this case the the, the, the epidemic curve goes flat so from go, from from the picture from the picture of this epidemic curve we come to know whether whether there is there is a the, the, the we come to know whether there is a common source or whether there is a host to host transmission now what is the point source outbreak is an outbreak when the everyone falls sick within one incubation period say for say for uh, so, uh, exa, exa, examples of common incubation period say when we were uh, like in burkholderia or uh, burkholderia uh, uh, outbreak the incubation period being 4 to 72 hours if in this common common out, out, outbreak or in any other such infection if it in the, within this incubation period most of the patient develop the infection then it is a point source there might be a common source and and there is a point there is a, there is a point source that is responsible for an outbreak or increase in cases if we see another another outbreak is a continuous source outbreak means uh, is is an outbreak that involves ongoing source of contamination that from patient to patient staff to staff as i said before then such exposure time is prolonged the epidemic curve is very long and flatters and when only all the people develop immunity so so uh, so, so we, we, when the paper the, when the immunity is satisfied when it is more then this outbreak go outbreak gets uh, uh, controlled such outbreak are continuous source outbreak now in, in this point source outbreak when uh, uh, in this case like or in the person pass the infection to other people after the incubation period in such instances the outbreak stops after the in this case stops transmitting the infection as you can see from the picture the in case of a point source outbreak only it depends upon the point source that is where the patient was already infected first time infected that is the index case when the when the index case gets uh, uh, gets uh, treatment uh stop that <clears throat> then when need we are able to control this outbreak and it is very important to understand the different types of outbreak and and the source and to control this outbreak point source with an index case and the propagated spread is another thing it starts like an infection from a single index case and it is prolonged prolonged but a newly infected people further acts as a source and the propagates the infection and continues transmitting the infection in such cases the outbreak stops only when there is a decline in the number of susceptible people so if in in this case we already transmit an infection and further such index further such patient further such susceptible people gets added to the index case and get, get, there's a propagated spread of infection so if we limit the number of susceptible people in such outbreak we will be able to control the outbreak now how to detect this outbreak it is done by different surveillance techniques so it can be done either by passive surveillance or active surveillance or sentinel surveillance or syndromic surveillance now what is passive surveillance passive surveillance means monitoring the routinely collected health data means monitoring or seeing or or the culture culture and sensitivity report the water reports the air sample report and monitoring the monitoring the routinely collected health data active surveillance means whenever when we actually uh, go to the, the settings uh, the department and active when there is suspect and we actually obtain the health data like for uh, like in dialysis we do we don't because do routinely the blood cultures but when we suspect that there is an outbreak of sepsis because of burkholderia we will actually collect the blood culture data and get the sample collected and get the blood culture data that is active surveillance sentinel surveillance means the selected groups provide the, the, provide the health data means which is a retrospective it can be seen as a retrospective or the uh, what are the available data is there the selected groups are provide the health data syndrome surveillance based on syndromic uh, 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 syndromes like uh, sepsis or pneumonia the monitoring of the healthcare syndromes is done that is syndrome surveillance the information can, can can also be collected through newspaper and social media post for 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 detecting an outbreak Now, what is required for outbreak preparedness? After obtaining information regarding the outbreak, hospitals should 
do following. What is uh, what it needs to do? It's to form and train rapid response team, then conduct periodic review of the data, update the plans for outbreak investigations, identify the outbreak region, arrange necessary drugs and materials, straighten the diagnostics. Uh, again, coming to example for blood culture, the set, uh, will, uh, uh, rapid immediate uh, testing should be done for the blood cultures. Or straighten the diagnostics, straighten the liaison with other healthcare system and public health authorities for to prepare ourselves for to, to prepare the health uh, health setting for preparedness for an outbreak. So what are the steps in order? Detect outbreak is the first important step. Detect that there is a possible outbreak. Then find cases. Then find do the line listing of the cases. Find cases. How many people are involved are getting infected or involved in this outbreak? First, to detect an outbreak. Second, find the cases in, in, in the out, outbreak. Third, then generate the hypothesis, whether the, the, what, uh, do interviews, get staff interviews, get testing done, generate hypothesis, hypothesis that, okay, this uh, there's a, there's a corona-like outbreak here, and the common, common, common source of this infection can be this contaminated water supply from this particular area. Or there is a burkhold area sepsis here, or the common uh, issue can, can be uh, contaminated RO water from the particular outlet. So generate this hypothesis, then test the hypothesis through studies like culture testings and lab testing and others. Test that our hypothesis, uh, the hypothesis, and then solve the point of contamination. Then next, solve the point of contamination. If this is okay, RO water is contaminated, or the drinking water is contaminated. Solve the point of contamination. That is the most important inter, uh, interruption, uh, uh, inter intervention that uh, the step uh, that is solve the point of contam contamination and the original source of outbreak vehicle. Then control. Outbreak should, should be controlled through recalls, the facility improvements, and industry collaboration. Thirdly, then decide after the outbreak is over, decide that an outbreak is over. And lastly, it should be communicated to the stakeholders that, okay, the outbreak is over. If the outbreak is definitely under control, then again, go back to the generating the hypothesis, test your hypothesis, solve the contamination issue, and control the outbreak. An outbreak investigation should consist of confirming first, confirming there is an outbreak. There can be also a zero outbreak also. It can happen that the, the, the lab has, uh, has strengthened its diagnostic capacity, okay, ability, and that we can, and that they have started reporting more cases of uh, infections. It can happen to so be aware of such issue of outbreak and confirm if there is a real outbreak. Out, outbreak. Then describe the describing describe the outbreak in terms of time, place, and person. Deter, determine the, determine the cause of an outbreak and finally controlling the outbreak. The first step of confirming out, out, outbreak information is confirming that there is an outbreak. The, for this, compare 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 the current data with the baseline level of baseline data that is about the prevalence of the disease in the population, uh, and as and as uh, analyze it. Then there are several reasons, as I said before, to make uh, that zero outbreak, such as improved diagnostics uh, or testing methods, which can lead to over reporting compared to the previous method or lab errors are increasing the population also. All these reasons should be ruled out before devising ways to control an outbreak. Then verify the diagnosis by reviewing the clinical and the lab data. Whenever there is a suspected outbreak, verify the diagnosis to rule out the outbreak by reviewing the clinical data as well as lab data, which will help us in finding the reason for an outbreak and to identify ways to control it. And based on this information, the investigating team should devise ways to control an outbreak. Then describe the outbreak. After confirming the outbreak, describe the outbreak in terms of time, place, and person, which include which could include questions like who is the case? How many cases have been found? What is the description of the cases? Now the case definition should uh, follow some criteria that will help classify a person as a case. Uh, then what is the time? How much is the time or duration in which this outbreak has occurred? Or where is the place, which place is involved in this outbreak? Who are the persons who are involved? And the clinical and the lab features should be described in detail about that outbreak. Uh, then all cases are identified in a systematic order 
and that relevant information should be recorded using questionnaires. Next, cases should be summarized by time, place, and person in an outbreak. Then line listing of the cases should be done. For example, you can see from the slide, patient one to 10, the either age, the gender, the date of one set of the infection, the clinical features like, let's say, abdominal pain or diarrhea, and the lab features like tool testing results should be shared in the line listing of cases for an outbreak, for an outbreak investigation. Outbreak detection and the response uh, should, uh, should include, uh, the, should be plotted like, like from, the, from the present slide. It should include the first case, the detection reporting, the lab confirmation, the response, the timeline should be, uh, should be, should be available uh, in an outbreak investigation report. The number of cases involved, and, and as per the days, uh, how, uh, what, what was the, what was the in, uh, intervention done, and what was the result? Other description of outbreaks so includes like a place. It like a place involved in outbreak should be identified and recorded. It helps in identifying the geographical spread of the disease and identify if there are any many other such any clusters. Geographical information system that is GIS may be used to map and track the outbreaks. Now describing the people, people who have been have been affected in outbreak, affected uh, their age, gender, occupancy, and ethnicity needs to be recorded to provide information about a disease and identifying who further may be at the risk of infection. So, so part of, say people, a particular group of people from a health setting like are getting cholera. So if, you, if they're more from food, if they're food handlers, that needs to be identified and the kitchen area needs to be specially focused for the, for the same. You all this information of these cases in terms of time, place, and person. You all this information, what is the pathogen involved, what may be more of the probable source, and what will be the mode of transmission. And based on this evaluated information, determine the cause, generate a hypothesis. After describing an outbreak in terms of time, place, and person, the investigator should determine the likely cause of the outbreak, also called as hypothesis. If the pathogen that caused the infection is already known, then it is easy to find uh, the mode of the the source and the mode of transmission. For example, if the outbreak is cholera, then the source of contamination is contaminated water. Salmonella so outbreak is due to contaminated eggs or meat. If the pathogen is unknown, then the investigator should test and confirm the likely source of outbreak. This can be done using an analytical epidemiological study such as core study or a case control study also. Now, what are the tests for hypothesis? The, uh, the epidemiological studies help in determining how likely the factor is responsible for outbreak. And environmental indication helps in confirming the hypothesis. For example, in a foodborne outbreak, environmental factors such as contaminated eggs, improper food storage, improper hygiene are some of the factors that lead to an outbreak. So lab provides microbiological information to confirm the hypothesis. So when a hypothesis is generated, it is, it is lab which, which helps us to confirm the hypothesis. Now we have described, we have identified the outbreak, we, have conf we confirmed, we have described the outbreak, we have generated hypothesis, tested hypothesis. Now, what are the controlled measures? The controlled measures could be different uh, as, as, per, as, as per the nature of the outbreak. <clears throat> it can be a behavioral, like using a mosquito repellent in case of an outbreak of a chikungunya or an other, 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 other such a, uh, outbreak. Or it can be a vaccination, either measles vaccine, or it can be medications like ivermectin um, for, for, uh, for, di for, 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 for uh, uh, diabetes and cases. Or it can be environmental measures like spraying insecticide for outbreak for, for malaria and other. It can be for infection control measures like using following personal protective equipment and hygiene stringently against particular infections like burkholder and other. It could be health education, the targeting and appropriate education targeted uh, for in the healthcare setting. So the outbreak control, outbreak control measures should could, could be one of these or can be a multi, multi can, can include most of these measures in, in for a particular outbreak. And it all depends upon a strong surveillance. Lastly, but not the least, is the communication, the stakeholders. Communication is an important aspect in any outbreak. Accurate and timely information regarding the outbreak should be communicated to people internal and external to the, or, to the, to the, organ, to the, organ, to the organization. Communicating about the outbreak will, with the public, especially those affected by the outbreak, is extremely important as, as it helps them to adopt productive behavior and take part in the basis in the disease surveillance. It also reduces the anxiety and uh, confusion and curbs the spread of misinform in misinformation.
media can be used for outbreak communication or sharing information on online forms uh, and uh, scientific journals on an outbreak and lessons learned can help manage future outbreaks in, in an effective way. As I said before, the outbreak should be declared over after the investigators are satisfied that the, that the outbreak is under control. For infectious diseases, it is generally after two incubation period. Please note that outbreaks is declared as over after two incubation period for infectious diseases. So that was all about out, 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 outbreak. Uh, I now further open this uh, session for uh, uh, discussion. Before going to discussion, let, let me, for, uh, the, for the people who missed for the initial part, uh, uh, regarding, uh, regarding the healthcare associated infections, let me cover about the healthcare associated infection uh, in uh, detail again. Healthcare associated infection, I uh, to repeat, these are the infections. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, this it can be uh, the misnomer. Uh, it can also called as hospital acquired infections or nosocomial infections. However, the nosocomial in, infections is a misnomer. The correct term, term term is healthcare associated healthcare associated infection. Healthcare associated infections are infections occurring 48 hours after admission to the hospital. 48 hours is the general the incubation period. If the organism says pseudomonas or burkholderia, where the organism uh, incubation period is about 72 hours. So, depending upon the healthcare associated infection, can be called uh, for those pseudomonas infection in a patient uh, 22 hours after the admission, it is the infection labeled as healthcare associated. So, based on the incubation period of the, of the uh, pathogen causing the infection in the patient, we do identify this particular infection as healthcare associated or not. So it also includes uh, infection after discharge. This is the factor that differs it from nosocomal. Nosocomal infection or infection while during patient stay in the hospital. While healthcare associated infection includes infection after discharge, say, uh, say for a surgical site infection, it is 30 days after discharge, uh, uh, 30 days of, uh, after the discharge of, from the hospital. So that that was about was uh, that was healthcare associated in patient definitions. I uh, I opened the further part of the uh, this uh, program for uh, questions and answers. I'll open the chat box here. The first question is uh, is uh, was about uh, pressure vent uh, negative pressure room. The negative pressure room. What should be the pressures maintained? What kind of patients need this kind of rooms? This is the question. Uh, now, as uh, said in the presentation before, uh, in to, to simplify, patients who are infected, say if infected like uh, co uh, like H1N1 or um, uh, uh, COVID-19 or tuberculosis or uh, uh, and uh, other such in, uh, infections, which can get transmitted by airborne route like to uh, measles, chicken pox, tuberculosis, COVID-19 uh, virus or H1, pandemic H1N1 virus. For such uh, infections, uh, which get transmitted by airborne route, negative pressure room uh, is required. And what is the pressure maintained? It is usually minus two and a half pascals of pressure. I hope this uh, uh, question is answered. Uh, hello, uh, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Dr. Rahul. Yes. Uh, sir, I have few queries. Uh, number one, again, okay, microscopic slides. So earlier, it, uh, do we need to discard them in blue bins? Blue microscopic slides. If you if you if you refer to the current uh, current uh, the the amendment, if uh, I won't I'll be able to share it right now. But you refer to the uh, recent amendments. You will find glass slides uh, for staining being this uh, should be desegregated into blue containers. Even my even microbiological slides also. Yes, all yes, the glass. Yes, yes, yes. Please refer, refer. Right now, I don't have a uh, reference library available. You can refer to the slide. 
and uh, that has to be filled with first they have to be pre treated with uh, hypo 1% hypo and then we have to autoclave and then shift it yes for okay. now in most yeah it should be uh, for this infected with one freshly prepared 1% hypochlorite solution so the once prepared freshly prepared the viability of a hypochlorite solution is arranged from 8 to 24 hours so it should be daily daily uh, replaced in the hypochlorite solution okay okay yes, second thing sir uh, second thing uh, the autoclave uh, time period like according to i've uh, studied somewhere in this iso 15189 they have said the time to be for 1 hour is it 30 minutes or 1 hour uh, this uh, this was the uh, common and nc uh, raised in most of the health settings during this covid 19 yeah so the 20 minutes was is the sterilization uh, 20 minutes is, is a uh, has been uh, the, if you refer to the present uh, mpcp guideline for uh, biomedical waste it is one hour one hour is required for sterilization uh, of uh, biomedical waste so we should go for one hour only no? yeah 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 okay and sir one more thing like yellow bins we have divided in two one for biohazard and other one cytotoxic drugs yes. yellow bins yeah blood bags have to be is there uh, uh, blood bags have to be given in uh, the normal one uh, i blood yeah. bags blood bags should be discarded segregated into the uh, um, not, not in the cytotoxic but it should be discarded into the yellow bag with a biohazard symbol okay sir so uh, instead of used on the blood banks is often seen that they are discarded into the red bags, saying that it is a plastic one. But uh, as per the guidelines, it should be discarded into yellow bags. Okay, sir. So one more query: like OPA instead of Cydex, we have to use OPA for uh, bronchoscopes, endoscopes. Then what is what other things? You refer to the CDC sterilization and disinfection guidelines of 2008. Therein, okay. it is uh, clearly mentioned that a 2.54 percent total DI is inactive or very less active against the atypical mycobacteria yes, mycobacteria yes. is group of organism causing tuberculosis uh, oh, yes. uh, uh, so they are not active hence for bronchoscopy uh, uh, instead of guttural dead it is advised for a other alternative like opa orthopedaldehyde or parasitic acid or hydrogen peroxide but the most safer and cost effective will be a OP, opa as an alternative to guttural dead that was about the efficacy regarding efficacy. Also, another thing is brutal died. Uh, is a um, if you if you if you if you see why the housekeeping people preparing brutal died, you will you will, uh, you will agree they, they are strong, they're strong, they're toxic. It's necessary to very toxic fumes. Uh, 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 even the uh, housekeeping people, uh, the attendants who are preparing the brutal solution, their hands can bombed. Uh, so it's a uh, while preparing brutal solution. So uh, also the uh, viability of brutal solution solutions is very le le uh, uh, less. So brutal solution is a respiratory allergic and also toxic. So it should, it should be avoided in healthcare settings. Yes, sir. Um, my actually point was in, uh, the two things are clear: bronchoscopes uh, and endoscopes. And what other uh, we have to clean with this? Well, the bronchoscopes and endoscopes will go with this thing. There are others we have to. Re I will refer to the guidelines there. Yeah, we can refer to guidelines. Say another example: say laryngoscopic blades. Now, okay. uh, I have seen during the root cause analysis of uh, ventilated associated pneumonia or uh, respiratory attack infection, wherever when uh, the laryngoscopic blades are used, often it is seen that the laryngoscopic blades are just uh, uh, reused with washing with soap and water or or disinfected with alcohol. Okay. That's a common practice. So it is. It is. Uh, it is. If you can refer to the that sterilization guidelines of CDC 2008, this it means clearly mentioned the such laryngoscopic blades, which comes under semi-critical category of Spalding's classification, should be disinfected, should be cleaned and disinfected by a medium-level disinfectant like ammonium compound, the ammonium compound or, or, or others. Okay. That Thank was you. one of the root, uh, one of the uh, thing that I often observed while doing RCA or root cause analysis of ventral acid pneumonia and respiratory tract infections. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll go to the chat, chat box. Hello, sir. 
am i am i audible hello sir yeah 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 so regarding ot culture reporting and ot fumigation what is your recommendations uh my chat box is not is not opening so we like to answer through uh, your verbal questioning only uh regarding ot fumigation or ot fogging so, ot scrubbing and ot culture sir me me ot ot culture report sir uh, how much colony count should we report and how how significant See, of them uh, there there are also yes, guidelines for available yes, for operation yes, theaters yes, uh, of ot yes, uh, col colony count uh we will uh, uh, 35 colony forming 35 colonies per 1000 cubic meter of the area is is taken as a cut off now this colony count differs from the types of ot there are different types of ot there are categories of ots type okay. 1 2 3 4 5 so for say for a bone marrow transplant uh, ot for a trans implant uh, ot is where implants or transplants are done or uh, critical processes are done for them 10 colony forming units per 1000 uh, cubic meter uh, uh, is the cut off for uh, in general it is a 35 unit 35 colony count so it differs from ot to ot uh, uh, i for i didn't mention in my slides here but it will be including my next slide or it will may share with you the uh, reference available so uh, the colony count the usually ranges usually the ranges uh, the colony count range from about 30 to 40 colony count per 1000 cubic meter of the room okay. please sir share reference sir, any for any range for gram positive or gram negative also for gram or positive or any anything con cfu for gram positive or gram negative also yeah 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 sir this 35 colony include all pathogenic non pathogenic uh, nothing significant like pathogenic yes, is... yes 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 okay okay And this sir, is what the critical with... critical ot is high risk okay. ot is Uh, in, uh, where, where general processes are like uh, it's about forty, thirty to forty. Ranges from thirty to forty. Sir, share uh, share a reference for reading. Will do, will do. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, will refer to my chat box is ha uh, is not opening, so we'll try to answer this question. Now, is it necessary to fumigate the labs? Hello, sir. Are you listening, sir? Please. Yes, yes. Uh, sir, we should report bacillus species also in the swab, uh, swab, uh, like uh, ball and AC duct and ceilings. Bacillus or... species are non are non pathogenic and thermo resistant group of organisms, so that they should they should not they should not be reported. It is often isolated uh, from uh, uh, the air culture samples uh, and settle settle plates. So the bacillus species should be ignored. They they we should uh, we can report them no growth or no significant. Yeah yeah yeah. Pathogen. You can report it as no uh, no no growth or no okay. no pathogen growth. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good Am afternoon. I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So actually, I wanted to ask uh, uh, your take on environmental surveillance of the hospital, especially the critical care areas like IVF, OT, uh, ICUs, NICU, PICU, etc. Uh, what should be the frequency and uh, uh, is the swab culture more uh, preferred or air culture more preferred and is there any guideline indian guideline which we can follow for this uh we uh, regarding the you can refer to the cdc guideline for environment it's called the guideline uh, the guideline is environmental infection control in healthcare settings uh, i think the year is around, is around 2011 or 2004 something around So refer to that guideline. So they have maintained. They have mentioned unless there is a rise in the infection or if there is an outbreak, environmental solution, environmental surveillance uh, should should be our our regular environmental surve surveillance that is collecting air samples or settle plates or exposure plates or swapping should be avoided. Regular should be avoided or a minimum frequency should be kept uh, for 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 environmental surveillance. Uh, uh, that that is a guideline. That is the, the guideline says it's environmental infection control in healthcare setting. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, regarding is... the environmental surveillance of Indian in Indian setting, the guidelines you can I had mentioned in my slides also. It is a national infection control guidelines. In that guideline, they also they have mentioned in detail about the environmental surveillance. Sir, okay. is there and, any uh, guideline for the modular OT? Modular OT. Are uh, you? 
yeah, there is a guideline. You refer again to the National Inflation Control Guidelines. It has been recently made available, uh, released. Okay. Uh, National Inflation Control Guidelines by ICMR? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, what is the uh, uh, NABH uh, suggestion for this environmental uh, sampling, etc.? What is the NABH's requirement? The NABH has NABH, NABH hasn't given any requirement. Okay, you do. It's, it's the hospital that, that can give, define that protocol, that can okay. uh, make that protocol. Mm -hmm. It depends upon the prevalence of the organisms, uh, the, the, the prevalence of the infections in the particular healthcare setting, where the environmental surveillance frequency can be identified and may, uh, protocoled. Okay. And how to check uh, the housekeeping services, whether uh, they are disinfecting everything properly in the hospital areas, like surface dis disinfection and cleaning. So is there any protocol for that? Uh, this question, again, again, this is with the, with the surface swabbing and the settle plates. From the mm -hmm. surface swabbing of this uh, areas, like, like the housekeeping, doing cleaning in the OT, we can have surface swabs from the particular rooms, or OT rooms. We can do surface swabbing, or air sampling or exposure plates. Now, for mm -hmm. organisms like organisms which are which bear which are spore bearing organisms, is it's better that we have a, a air sampling or a settle plate. Or, or for organisms like Pseudomonas burkholder and others, it is better that we do a swabbing. But so differ from uh, uh, pathogen to pathogen that we employ the method. Either it can be a swab method or a set or air sampling. A combination of both will will be will be is, is uh, will be better. And the frequency that is advisable here for housekeeping. At least the high risk areas, uh, the frequency has not been given by any of the guidelines to so how much the uh -huh. frequency, but it's commonly seen that, that, that at least once a month, at least the high risk areas like OT, cath lab, dialysis, okay. uh, CSSD, uh, casualty should be done at least once a month. Okay, okay. Sir, Thank you. Sir, we should go for the anaerobic culture also for the environmental sampling routinely. Uh, no. uh, I couldn't hear you. Yes. Sir, we should go for the anaerobic culture also for the environmental sampling. Not required. Anaerobic culture, even we don't, uh, it's not commonly done from even for the patient samples. And then uh, environmental cleaning also we don't, is not required because anaerobic uh, infections are very rarely, they cause serious infections. As we see the cost of epitoninus and other so feasibility, in us, uh, it's very difficult to do anaerobic cultures also. So uh, okay. seeing the feasibility and the cost of cleanliness and seeing that the anaerobic infection rarely cause serious infection. Yeah, prostudent deficial causes infections. Now, based on the prevalence of this prostudent deficient infection, uh, anaerobic culture can be employed or not based on the uh, antibiogram of the hospital setting. Okay, sir. Thank you. And one more thing, sir, dear. Anaerobic regarding for example, I, we, can, uh, we can take a raw person cook meat media, media or any, any, any other such or thioglycated medium or any other such medium, if they are suspected that we have a prostitium infection uh, from the if there is a turbidity from the RCM, of, yes. say we, can, we swab it the, the areas of OT and put it in the RCM, and there is a turbidity, and that from the turbidity, uh, then we can go for a prostitium identification <laughs> if suspected. Okay, sir. Uh, so there is one more question regarding B, uh, BMW. Uh, how are we supposed to discard the uh, discarded uh, blood culture bottles? Blood culture bottles uh, comes under microbiology. It is a commonest yeah. uh, waste from microbiology lab. Uh, so, and as per the guidelines, it goes into yellow bags. So we have to directly throw them in yellow bag because we, these are we have yellow bags and then autoclaved and then discarded or the same to agency for treatment. But these are like uh, made up of uh, glass many a times. But they, are, uh, they come under microbiology waste and they're highly infectious. Okay, so they have to be discarded in the plastic bag only, not in the blue container, after, no, no, even no, after no. autoclaving. Okay, no. okay. Shall we take a five minutes break again and we will open it again for the final for, for the discussion? Let's have a five minutes break and we'll, we'll, we'll okay. rejoin. Okay, sir.
so uh, let's rejoin again uh let's open for the open question and discussions uh, question and answer discussion again open the, i open the session for question discuss, question and answers any queries related, related to antibody policy or antibiogram or stewardship or hand or isolation precautions i hope uh, i have addressed the expectations of the participants here we had a uh, initial disturbance in the beginning uh, but let's i hope uh, it's clear now yeah, regarding transmission based precautions if anyone has any query regarding airborne precautions or droplet precautions so we are open for this uh, discussion good afternoon sir actually my query is that if bacillus is isolated from ro water supply ro water should be completely completely free from any organism even if bacillus is isolated then yes. uh, see that uh, it should not be isolated if there is a contamination it so, can be a contamination during collection most probably the bacillus cannot uh, bacillus is rarely obtained from ro water so see that your method of collection is proper uh, for collecting ro water sample, for collection of the ro water sample yes if any other organism other than the bacillus like burpledia or pseudomonas or such hydrophilic organisms are isolated from the ro water then it is advised that you check the ro water membrane whether it has been cleaned whether uh, whether it, uh, it is functioning if seeing the records of its six monthly maintenance or seeing whether it has been repaired re replaced yearly or two yearly as per the manufacturer instructions so whenever ro water is contaminated or it the uh, or the endotoxic levels of the ro water is more than 2.5 units then check these parameters whether they are repaired or replaced or cleaning done at uh, as per uh, plan of the ro water plant yes sir thank you sir <clears throat> any other questions it is often i didn't went to do the details of uh, device related infection here uh, if you when you calculate when we monitor in among the healthcare associated infection for four uh, healthcare associated infections which are device related one is uh, central and associated bloodstream infection another is ventilator associated pneumonia uh, a third is catheter associated urinary tract infection and fourth is surgical site infection so when you add in when you do a surveillance say for clap c that is central line associated bloodstream infections most of the time it's the it, it is a, uh, the healthcare personnel uh, uh, take into account only the peripheral blood culture but to refer to the guy guy definitely cdc definition of clap c it is central line blood should be collected along with the peripheral line blood if you want to identify clap c and the central line blood culture should uh, uh, be positive to 2 hours be positive from a from the blood culture equipment 2 hours early than the peripheral blood culture or else uh, that hour, the hours can not be monitored then the central line blood culture should yield colonies four times more than the peripheral blood culture uh, so that we can say that the particular positive blood culture is central line associated blood stream infection so it it should be a protocol in the healthcare setting for to for if a central line, line associated blood stream infection is suspected so along with the central line peripheral blood culture should also be collected and when you collect a blood culture that culture should be in a set and that set should include an aerobic bottle as well as an anaerobic bottle if there are multiple lumens for the central line then actually it is recommended to collect a uh, blood sample from each of the lumens but at least the set of the blood culture uh, from a central line and a peripheral line should include both the aerobic and anaerobic bottles uh, to uh, explain 
not all the organisms causing burst limb infections or any other infections are strictly aerobic. A, around a large group of organisms or pathogens are faculty to anaerobes. So not all organisms are strictly aerobic or not all organisms are strictly anaerobic. A major group of organisms are faculty to anaerobes that it can grow in the even in the absence of oxygen also. It is a faculty anaerobe. So this uh, faculty anaerobic group includes organisms like E. coli, Klebsiella, Staph, Stepto, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, E. coli, Klebsiella. So these are the commonest organisms causing Helicobacter infection. And hence, for identifying this infection, anaerobic bottle should be paired up with an anaerobic bottle. Uh, as per guidelines, also it, uh, for NABL and NABL, uh, NABL guidelines, such paired bottles should be collected from uh, while we collect a peripheral blood culture as well as a central line blood culture. For, uh, it has been seen that uh, when you collect only just an Arabic bottle, most of the time the faculty in Europe like E. coli clepsila doesn't grow from that Arabic bottle or it grows very, very late. There is a poor growth. So th this can happen. Secondly, regarding catheter associated urinary infection, often colonizers are uh, uh, yielded from uh, urine samples of ca uh, police catheter. So see that uh, the sampling of the urine is done under aseptic precautions from the sampling port of the urine catheter and not from the urine bags. Thirdly, when for a surgical site infection, uh, proper the, um, the surveillance activities should include uh, the uh, pro proper follow up with the patient's post discharge also as to, tel to telephonic calls. They can have a regular scheduled maintain, say about fifth day after the discharge, 10 day after the discharge, then uh, 23 day after discharge, 30th day final discharge. The telephonic call should be given to the patient and should be inquired about the uh, status of the surgical site, uh, of operated surgical site. Fourthly, regarding the ventilator acidotic pneumonia, uh, uh, so it, uh, the common RCA observed for VAP is uh, regarding is uh, about uh, poor oral health hygiene. In chronically ill patients with ventilator acid pneumonia, often pseudomonas, acidobacter, brobercoldera are often the common uh, pathogens causing infections. And when we do oral hygiene, it is a, uh, there's a chlorohexidine that is commonly used. Chlorohexidine is not active against this uh, group of organisms like pseudomonas. So, uh, Oftenidiol and other such uh, oral antiseptic solutions can be used, which is active against the gram negative bacteria for such chronically ill patients with suspended pseudomonas and burkholder type of group of organisms. So, oral hygiene should be focused, should be given special attention if want to prevent and control VAP. So, that is about each of the uh, individual uh, healthcare associated uh, device related infections, party collapsing, VAP, and SSI. Any questions? Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is there any is there any uh, benchmark for uh, all the hospital acquired infections, sir? The various associated infections yes. like SSI, we, CLAP, uh, CLAP C. Yes. So they uh, regarding uh, regarding the regarding the benchmarks for healthcare associated uh, healthcare associated infections, we can either fo follow the uh, Indian Society of Critical Medicine uh, benchmarks, uh, which is most commonly followed by the hospitals, or you can follow the uh, guy, uh, benchmarks given by Rosenthal Project uh, uh, for, 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 for monitoring healthcare associated infections. Sir, one more question. Uh, one of the doctor was discussing about discarding of the slides in the blue bin. So in that blue bin, you meant uh, the one which we use for discarding the broken glass vials and all the yes, things. Yes, yes, right, yes, sir? yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So one more thing. Most of the time, if you calculate most of the device-associated infections will be like a zero. Uh, we cannot prove, uh, like uh, as you say in class, the two hours or the colonies, we may not isolate very rarely. We get same organism from central line and peripheral line. So how do we present during an ABH audit? Like, uh, uh, the, your whether, uh, is how to argue for our, uh, the data is fake and all, uh, how to argue for that? Your, uh, your uh, uh, 
uh, equation is that we most of the time should get zero infection rate, say from yes, exactly. Sure as a sign. Exactly, so this exactly, you are right. Is, sir. The, the, uh, the, uh, the when they come to the audit, they don't accept this this your values. The re, the exactly, re, sir. Because it cannot happen that they have, that it can be completely zero. Uh, the collapse or the SSI in more, even in European uh, in, in developed countries with with a stringent infection control compliance, the, the healthcare asset infections are uh, are reported uh, are bound to occur and are reported also. So when we don't have any uh, uh, healthcare uh, infection like CAPS or SSI or uh, VAP or other treatment things, uh, things uh, probably might be that our uh, the, the clinicians might be administering antibiotics, higher antibiotics. Before giving the samples for culture, and hence we get the because culture is the is, is used uh, used as a base for identifying in patients as healthcare associated. So uh, most of the time, the, after administering the empirical therapy with high antibiotics, if the cultures are sent, then it is bound to give negative culture. So you need we need to improve in the for those settings. We need to focus and emphasize more on sending cultures for test uh, sending samples for cultures before administering antibiotics. So for example, if a blood culture has been sent, it should be created just before the spike of fever and it should include sets if you're creating uh, the, uh, so, so the, the, the proper cul sampling, uh, culture sampling should, uh, should be followed uh, because they are the base for identifying healthcare associated infections. If you say SSI is zero, that, 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 can, be a, that, that, can, that, that can be also probably not, not possible. If the, the, you have to strengthen your surveillance uh, proto protocol uh, follow-up with the patients for identifying SSI uh, another. Okay, sir. thank you, sir. Sir, any CDC benchmarkers available for this? CDC, CDC, uh, CDC, particular benchmark. CDC doesn't give any, doesn't hasn't given any benchmark for a particular country. But if you can, if you can refer to the literature. You can have a review of literature of, of the of, uh, and from the studies. You can get benchmarks. Uh, uh, but in in India, we follow Indian Society of Critical Medicine benchmarks. We uh, at some of the healthcare settings follow. There, there was a Rosenthal project. Some of the participants might be knowing this. That there was a Rosenthal project uh, in India which gave these uh, this benchmarks and uh, a decade back uh, for, for uh, this device related infections. And this project uh, was among the different hospitals of most of the hospitals across the country. So that uh, benchmarks given by the Rosenthal project can be adopted for, for tracking healthcare asset infections, or else the Indian Society of Critical Medicine benchmarks can also be taken into account. Okay, sir. Thank we you. We can sir. have their own. We can have our own hospitals uh, benchmark based on the prevalence of our uh, infection in the healthcare setting. The, the other benchmarks are just a guide for us to follow. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, any need, any uh, recommendation for fumigation of lab or is it necessary or any frequency mentioned somewhere? Uh, there are two terms. One is fumigation and another is fogging and third is terminal cleaning. Hmm. Uh, fogging, fumigation is done with a formal dehyde disinfectant which is, hmm. needs to be strictly avoided in healthcare setting. As said before, formal diet or guttural diet, such aldehydes are highly toxic to respiratory system, also to some extent carcinogenic. So it should, should be avoided as per OSHA guidelines. And second, so fumigation should be avoided. Second is fogging, fogging with any aerial, fogging with any disinfectant, say uh, whether it uh, say cotton and ammon compounds or any other solution. Fogging also. Needs to be avoided because release of this disinfectants into the air, uh, into the air might be uh, so some uh, the healthcare person might be uh, allergic to the to the to the to the to the to such this uh, in, in disinfectants if they're uh, which are mostly allergens or it can be toxic too. So fogging needs to be avoided except in an area except in pro activities like uh, construction, 
activities, uh, some repairing or uh, repairing activities are being done in the on the healthcare setting. In that, in those areas, uh, we can do. Uh, we can have a fogging. Uh, we can have fogging, but uh, it should be avoided as far as possible. Uh, uh, in, especially in areas like in uh, OTs, cat lab dialysis, where we have HEPA filters already available, then fogging is fogging. Uh, fogging is fogging is of no is of very little use. In such area, high risk areas uh, where HEPA filters are available, we can it is okay if we do only the terminal manual terminal cleaning. That is manually cleaning with the uh, with disinfection and using mops and dusters. But okay, see sir. that the disinfectant that you use should be EPA means it is advised, not mandatory, that it should be an EPA approved or EN approved or CE approved disinfectant that qualifies or conforms to the requirements of disinfection in healthcare setting. EPA that is Environmental Protection Agency, EN that is European Nations. So uh, see that all the intercepted and disinfectant that use in the healthcare settings are EN or EPA approved. It's advised. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, hello. Yes, ma'am. Huh. So, uh, uh, sir, I want to ask that uh, whenever we want to define CLAPSI in cases of neonates, what our neonatologists say is that the lines are so thin, they are not able to take uh, take out the blood from the central line for this uh, definition to be sought. Uh, so many a times, uh, whenever they have a clinical uh, CLAPSI, they just remove and uh, send the tip uh, of the central line to us along with the peripheral uh, uh, blood sample and if we uh, get the same bacterium in both uh, these uh, samples then do we consider it as a clapsy you tip tip use of a tip the the recent guidelines doesn't recommend uh, testing tips for identifying infections you know how much blood is required from a pediatric uh, from a new net uh, from a new net even uh, one ml of blood is enough even one ml of blood is enough. You can collect that blood into a pediatric bottle, not in the oh, adult yeah. bottle. Yes. So even one ml is an issue. Uh, one ml can so cannot be an issue for a, for for. A no, that's what our neonatologists always uh, mention in our meetings. Uh, that they are uh, not able they to, take to be sensitized to the to the need for taking culture. If you can refer to the literature of the blood culture bottles required for of the amount of blood required for a pediatric new Even oh, one ml true. can do uh, at least. The, yes. Yes. Even 0.5 to 1 ml uh, of uh, yeah yeah even 1 ml can do because the, the recently available bottles where where where, where, where they are feasible like uh, the back tech or the back uh, back tailored bottle that we use they even for them from from new nurse, one ml is enough okay but uh, what should but be the tip should, but tip should be avoided because it can give a uh, it can give false uh, positive result. No, if the tip and peripheral blood culture are if uh, they give the same if if they if if, if uh, if they give the same organ, actually it is not recommended. But if they if they give the same or if the same organism yielded from tape and the peripheral blood, the most likely it is the central and associated only then. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? So I hope uh, I finished with the questions and answers. Uh, and we'd like to uh, thank all the participants uh, for the kind attention and, and uh, thanks to the li listeners. I hope everyone have filled up the attendance form here. And, uh, and, and, and also <laughs> sorry for the interruption in the, in the beginning. And I hope uh, the presentation went well and it has addressed the expectations. And any queries you can you can you can let us know. Okay, if any questions you can contact me. Thanks, thanks a lot again for all the for all the participants here. Thank you, sir. Thanks thank, a lot. Thank, thank, thank. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
sir is it uh, possible you will share the slides sir because because of the internet connection in the initial part we couldn't attend it